Okay, uh, first of all, thank you, Crispino, for the organization and also the other organizers of this uh, meeting, and also to, uh, I mean, to be so kind to adjust to, for me to present this seminar. Thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, binary evolution in accretion disks in other media. So this uh, was a result. Uh, so this presentation is based on two papers that were published uh, in 2020, I think, in 2021, uh, in collaboration with Vitor Cardoso and Rodrigo Vicente. And uh, the main point here is to try uh, to capture the essential features that we uh, might have if we consider a uh, binary move, uh, evolving not in vacuum, but in, uh, in uh, uh, arbitrary media. I mean, let that, this be like uh, inside the boson stars, like what uh, Lorenzo will discuss in his uh, next lecture or accretion disks, or whatever you uh, might think. And so this is uh, uh, an outline of the presentation. I will discuss uh, the essential features that we, we, we want uh, for uh, analyze this, this uh, type of system. So basically, I will start with the very simple basics, uh, binary system and gravitational wave, the simplest setup possible. Uh, then I will discuss uh, some implications of having this media around your binary, uh, saying a bit about what happens when this binary is, is swimming or drifting through this medium. Uh, there are two things that might occur, which is uh, the binary being kicked uh, by the action of this uh, additional force that arises from uh, the medium itself. And then uh, another fact that is interesting and very important in gravitational wave observations which is the binary becoming eccentric. So let's start. So what are binaries? Binaries are, uh, compact binaries in particular, are systems that are bounded by gravitational force. So these, they live through uh, orbiting the center of mass, right? So you have two objects which can have different masses, which can have different natures. For instance, one can be a bos uh, boson star. It can be a boson star, okay? But can be a neutron star, it can be black holes. Uh, we actually observed many of these binaries. Um, just a minute. Forgot to put the timer. Okay. <laughs> so we actually observed many of these binaries. I, it's, it's nice to, to come next to people that show this uh, stellar graveyard because in there you can, uh, can actually put different uh, ways to configure this. So uh, here you can see the gravitational wave detect detections that you, we had in LIGO Vigor collaborations. And uh, it's nice to see that we are evolving in this uh, area of gravitational wave observations. And uh, this will become more and more uh, uh, populated, uh, and uh, we will have more data to analyze. So we have some detections of neutron stars, at least one. Uh, and we already have some Nobel Prize in the field, which uh, shows the importance of, uh, of this type of work, right? So we are focusing on this uh, type of binary. Most uh, results that we have uh, in binaries are considering uh, some, consider some approximations. And to say a little bit about how these binaries evolve, uh, we have to, to talk about a little about of their, li their uh, lives. So essentially, uh, we all seen this type of uh, plot before. It's a way to characterize, uh, to characterize how a binary lives uh, throughout his, uh, its existence. Uh, you have some phases. One is the spiral phase, which is uh, uh, where the binary spend most of the time because they evolve slowly through the emission of gravitational waves. They become closer and closer to each other, each a component of the binary. They then merge, which, are, uh, which is the domain of numerical relativity. Uh, in the end, they have this ring now, which is uh, this oscillation uh, that is dictated to, uh, from uh, perturbative uh, perturbation theory. Uh, in uh, the inspiral phase, which is uh, the stage that I am mostly interested in this uh, talk, uh, there are some nice way, and actually this is quite surprising of how accurate you can 
uh, uh, compute the evolution of the binary by just looking to the dominant term of uh, uh, Mikovsky expansion, like you consider that your metric is Mikovsky, Mikovsky and you see how uh, uh, binaries would emit gravitational waves, you get these very nice results by, uh, from, from Peters in 64, which is uh, the quadrupole formula, which essentially tells you how, uh, what is the dominant part of the radiation that comes out from this type of scenario. And you can model uh, the binary evolution by only looking to this. Uh, and in fact, this is basically what uh, Husey Taylor did to, to won, to won the, the Nobel Prize. Uh, so it's a nice result that is valid to, uh, to some distance until uh, the emergence of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the binary. But there are more extensions uh, that you can uh, perform to, to follow more precisely what the binary is doing. Uh, some of them are the effective on body, which is uh, an effective model that uh, improves a, a lot more uh, the evolution of binary, but you can also uh, look for post-Newtonian corrections. But in this work, I will only look to, to the essentials, so we shall uh, only focus on quadrupole approximations. Okay. In uh, also, because we are only looking to quadrupole approximations and the binaries are very far away, uh, each element of the binary is very far away from each other, it's safe to use uh, Newtonian forces to, to dictate the motion. So they are bind uh, by Newtonian forces, they emit gravitational wave, and this uh, makes the evolution of your system. So, and what we do is, uh, you have some energy for your system, you have the angular momentum that this binary has, uh, and you can write then very nicely in terms of the, uh, s this uh, semi-major uh, axis, right? And also in terms of the eccentricity of your uh, system. And when you do that, you can compute how the binary evolves by just equating uh, uh, some uh, quantities. You say, and this is, uh, of course, an assumption which is valid if your system is uh, evolved slowly enough. You say that when your system is losing energy, this will impact the, uh, the orbital quantities, which is the energy of, uh, of your system and the angular momentum as well. You equate this with the quadrupole formula, whatever energy losing, loses that you have in your, in your system. And when you do that, you have these nice equations for the same major axis and the eccentricities. So you, you might notice that I didn't write anything explicitly in these energy losses and angular momentum losses. But this is uh, just because this can come from many different places. So usually we, we consider that this comes from uh, gravitational waves. And when you uh, put the gravitational wave uh, from formulas to compute this uh, energy, uh, angular momentum and energy losses, what you get is that this is, uh, is, this is not very, <laughs> very readable, but the main message here is that if you start with a, with a binary that is highly eccentric, these equations would tell you that your system devolves to a more circular state. So you can summarize this by saying that gravitational waves circularize uh, your orbital motion. And this is a very nice result, and people argue uh, that this, uh, this is why you expect that in the LIGO band, LIGO Vigo band, you would observe uh, more circular uh, binaries than anything else, because in the end, they emit a lot of gravitational waves, and at the, at the end of the, light, life, the lifetime, you would expect the orbits to be circular. And uh, one interesting thing that you might uh, have in mind is, okay, you might have that your system is not only, uh, uh, not only have masses, but have all other types of charge. So Marco told us about this nonlinear electrodynamics, Carolina, not Carolina, but someone else told about right, the Nordstrom black holes. Uh, so you have all the types of black holes around there that have charges, like a, or scalar charges or whatever. And you might think that, okay, if I have additional charges, I have additional radiation in your system. So 
this system will not only emit gravitational waves, but will also emit electromagnetic waves and also scalar waves. And you might ask, okay, I know that gravitational waves makes your system circularize it, but what about these other fields? And you can do the computations. <coughs> Sorry. You can do the computation, it starts by assuming some interactions between the point particle and, uh, and the fields that they communicate with. And you can actually get that, in general, any radiative field, let, let it be scalar or electromagnetic, they will also have this effect of circularization in your orbital motion. So this is a very interesting uh, feature that seems to be quite general. And uh, it seems, everything seems to be pointing to the direction that you will have in the end circular motion. But <laughs> not at all. The thing is that there are all the, all the uh, features that might have in your uh, intergalactic medium, interstellar medium, that might affect the motion of, of your binary. The accretion disks by itself, you, we see uh, active galactic nuclei by the matter that is there. So there are a lot of matter surrounding black holes and you can have, and this accretion disk is, is very extensive, you can have binaries of stellar black holes living in, into this type of matter. You can have uh, dark matter, Lorenzo told, told us about dark matter and uh, how it populate the galaxy, galaxies and he will tell more about this uh, uh, binary uh, motion in dark matter. You, al you also have astrophysical scenarios that you can have a formation of this common envelope thing in which you have a black hole orbiting a star with a, a core and uh, for uh, some time of the, their life, you e effectively what you have is a binary motion inside this common envelope that uh, essentially is a binary moving inside a medium. So you have a lot of uh, possibilities and also you have a, a huge uh, range of uh, densities that you can have for your medium in, in which this binary can live. So uh, it's not, it's not uh, something uh, vague to assume that this matter might have an impact of the binary motion just because it's there. Even if it doesn't interact uh, directly, it always interacts gravitationally because gravitation, gravitation is a universal force. It only, it, this is what uh, the equivalence principle tells us. I mean, grav gravity interacts with everything. But what type of forces you uh, might uh, expect from this type of motion? So one of these forces, which I call in quotes forces because uh, it's not actually a force, is accretion. So if you have a moving object, like, uh, like, okay. So if you have a moving black hole, for instance, in a fluid, so imagine that you are, a black hole and you are moving within a pool of uniform density of whatever. What this will uh, do is that uh, matter will start to accrete into the black hole. And the black hole mass will increase and this by itself will change the motion of a, of a black hole. The black hole will become heavier and heavier and slower and slower. Uh, and in fact, this is something that you should consider when you have a binary moving in a medium because uh, if it is in a medium, the mass changes. And if the mass changes, you have that the minor motion will change. And the, in fact, there are some nice work considering black holes itself uh, and some analytical models considering how a black holes accrete. Uh, actually, uh, this absorption cross-section is also a type of accretion, a model accretion that you can have in your black hole. Uh, okay. And how do you describe this accretion? Like I said to you, there are different models that you might have. So how does it enter into, into equations? Remember that I'm considering everything uh, Newtonian. So the accretion can be relativistic because, because this is essentially the way that you put mass inside a black hole. But the evolution of the orbital motion is, does not need to be relativistic. So you see, the model of accretion can be relativistic, but the overall motion uh, is not necessarily is. So essentially, you have Newton's law of motion. You have some uh, derivative of the momentum here, and these will impact. Uh, will have impact on the derivative of the mass there. 
And in the end, you can see this part as an effective force. So you have an effective force that depends on this uh, derivative of how your mass is, is changing through the accretion. And there are some nice models that consider fluid dynamics and how this, uh, this moving uh, object accrete masses. And one that we have looked at into here, because it considers a, self, uh, a fluid that can, uh, uh, can have an interaction with itself, which is represented by this sound speed, is this bond hoyle lithium expression. But you can also consider other types of um, accretion models. Since we want to capture just the essential, just to see what would be the effect of these uh, environmental forces, we focus it on this, uh, this model. Um, and just to, to mention, in uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, together with Crispino, uh, Paulo Pani, and uh, Vito Cardoso, we try, it, we try to understand the influence of accretion in the evolution of a binary, but in this case, it's more focused on an extreme mass ratio in spiral regime in which you have a dark matter star and a particle evolving through uh, the vacuum and then at some point entering the star. And what we observed was that the evolution inside the star, if you look into the gravitational wave amplitude here, what you get is that the, the inside the star, because angular momentum is conserved, that is an interesting uh, fact about accretion, you don't have a change in the amplitude of your gravitational waves until it reaches the center and the motion stops. So this is a waveform considering only radiation-driven scenario, and this is when you consider accretion. So you can see that drastically changes your, your uh, way you see the, the, the waveform. But this is just a curiosity, okay? So another thing that you can have when you consider moving binary, move, uh, a binary moving within a, a medium, is something that Lorenzo already told us, is gravitational drag or dynamical friction. And basically what this, uh, uh, what this, ha what this, uh, uh, the, the effect of this uh, dynamical friction is you have a moving uh, uh, object, and all, since it's moving, you have that some particle will be uh, attracted to, to, uh, to uh, this part behind the moving object. Lorenzo had a nicer figure. I was going to copy your figure, but then <laughs> I gave up. Uh, so you have some that parts of the matter that is here is, come, is going to accumulate behind the, the moving object, and this, in the end, will generate an effective force, which is gravitational, and will uh, um, pull the, the object, essentially breaking it. Uh, so uh, again, you can describe this using just fluid mechanics. Uh, this part is non-relativistic, non but there are models that consider relativistic uh, uh, dynamical friction. And what you do is you add a, pertur a perturbation, which is a point particle. You solve this equation with your usual methods. And then you find uh, the force by just integrating uh, over this density perturbation to see uh, how uh, your motion changes. So attention to the hypothesis because this is important. Remember that uh, you can consider that you are in a uniform density medium and you start at some point moving this object. So when you start moving, what this uh, makes is uh, at the moment that you start moving, the perturbation starts to propagate and this is what is this uh, sphere is uh, telling you these are, these are different snapshots for a, a perturbed moving in the fluid. Notice that this is a, an asymmetric uh, configuration, and that's why you have a force uh, exerted in your particle, because it, if it was symmetric, you wouldn't have this force. And, and this is what happened, essentially. So because you have this asymmetric form, Okay, I will get back to losing this. So since you have this asymmetric force, you have an essentially a force acting this. These three, first three, this is for uh, subsonic motion. But when you have supersonic motion, you have some more 
dramatic uh, plot, which is the, which are these Mac cones. So, so these two are essentially the same configuration, but considering different uh, speeds for your uh, perturber. Um, but you can also have uh, other types of configuration because your medium cannot. Uh, 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 might not have a uniform density. You, uh, you might think that you are in a thin accretion disk and this will change because you have boundaries. You might think that you, you, are, you have not only one perturber, you have two, which is the case that you have. So you have binaries and then so on. You can change uh, a lot. So uh, I put some uh, phrase here, which is uh, from Groucho Marx, that these are my principle. If you don't like it, I have others, which means essentially if you don't like this hypothesis, you can always bring some more for the table, to the table. So these are some snapshots from uh, works uh, that have considered all the different scenarios for dynamic friction. You see that if you have a circular motion, there are some parts of, uh, of the, of the of, of, there are some stage of motions in which the particle interacts with its own wake and this might have an effect on your dynamic friction. But since we are considering spiral phase, we are lucky because uh, we don't expect for this effect to be important, right? Because they are well separated from each other. But you also have uh, subsonic cases. You also have this binary, in which you can have uh, many different uh, things to consider here. You have situation in which people consider thin accretion disks that uh, essentially add these additional layers, which comes from the fact that when you have a thin accretion disk scenarios, you can have some reflections in the boundaries, and which makes these uh, this contour plots. Mm. And also this for subsonic regime. So you have different ways to model your accretion. The way that we, we shall do is uh, to consider some uh, very simple model, which you can adjust a little bit your parameters in order to consider binary motion. Uh, but these are more phenomenological models because uh, some people have shown that you can actually capture most of the features of circular motion by using this, uh, this type of phenomenological uh, models. Okay, so uh, I, I would just uh, show this, that in the same work that I showed before, we also consider the effect of dynamical friction, and we also saw that the waveform changes a lot when you consider dynamical friction. So even in the extreme mass ratio in spiral, these, uh, these cases are very, uh, environmental forces are very important and should not be neglected. That, that's the main message here. Okay, so, and what about binary? So those results were for extreme mass ratio in spiral. I want to now see what happens to a binary if we uh, include, uh, if you put that, the binary inside a medium. So I told you that you have these effective forces. You have some motion. Uh, if you write the equations, essentially what you have is that you have some equation describing the separation of the binary, but you also have, in this case, some equations uh, describe, uh, equation describing the, uh, the evolution of the center of mass. And why is that? Is, uh, because your binary is not, uh, is, uh, not necessarily symmetric, the environmental forces acting on this component might be different than the ones acting on this. And these will generate an asymmetry that it reflects back into the center of mass uh, motion uh, just because you don't have things that uh, vanishes when you uh, do this kind of manipulations. And these uh, tell me that what you have is, uh, okay, these are some complicated equations, but just to show you, it, this tells you that if you start with a motion, uh, with a center of mass in one position, once you start to evolve your binary, the center of mass will acquire some acceleration and then will be displaced. We'll be swimming through this medium uh, uh, for a long time. Depends a lot, of course, on the evolution. So this is what you have, the two forces, they don't, vent, they don't uh, uh, know each other. Uh, you have this, uh, you have to give some initial conditions. What we gave for the binary was, Imagine that you have no environmental forces. If I uh, put the density to zero, 
the binary would stay there forever. So you, 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 we put the, that in uh, initial conditions such that without the forces, it's a usual uh, binary that you, you can have. So you can model this, uh, try to, to guess which are the, the, which are the best uh, points in your parameter space to improve this uh, center of mass acceleration. Uh, this will depend, of course, on the density or on the, on the mass ratio, because if the mass ratio is equal to one, you have a symmetric binary, and the forces acting on uh, each component are the same, and the binary doesn't swim. So uh, asymmetry is very important for, for this. And you can build this nice uh, parameter space in which you can uh, pick some binaries to see if this makes sense or not. So essentially, this part here is uh, uh, how do you construct this? You, you search for what is the component that makes the center of mass accelerate. So it depends on the density. But you cannot put your density very high, because if you are in a medium that is a very high density medium, what this would do is just break the binary and the two objects will collide, collide head on. So we have to, to have a small enough densities to let this binary evolve for a longer time. Uh, but you also have a center of mass drag, so this term here that is proportional to our dot is a drag force in the center of mass. So this we make the center of mass break, so you can have a look into that. And you also want for your binary to live for a long time, so you kind of uh, try to, to play around with these things. And what we saw was, uh, oh, can I? So uh, if you, Jardim, se puder, eu acho que dá para dar um playzinho aqui. Eu não. So this is a little movie. I don't know how how I. Okay. So this is what happens. Of course, this this is uh, uh, some non-physical parameter space, just to to give you a notion what of what is happening here. So you have a binary evolve. The black star is the center of mass. The red one is the heavier component, and the blue one is the lighter component. Can you, uh, so this is a separation distance, just to see one thing that I will show you later, which is the binary becoming eccentric. You see that it started, more, it started circular, and then if you let it evolve, it's becoming more and more eccentric. And this is in contrast, contrast what, of what you, I told you, about the, the, the effect of gravitational wave. And this, is show, this show us that the environmental force actually works against gravitational waves, making the binary eccentric. So I will jump to this one, okay. So this is the, uh, the speed of your center of mass. You cannot see the numbers here, but essentially what you have uh, is when your binary is evolving, the speed increases, the maximum uh, velocity that the center of mass acquire depends on the density of the medium. The smaller the density, the bigger is the maximum speed of your center of mass, but the longer it takes to, to achieve this maximum speed. And this uh, reflects, because this shows that the, the effect is like an accumulative effect. You, you have to let your binary evolve for a longer time in which, uh, for which you can uh, achieve this higher speed. And if you look into the number, uh, the speeds uh, are very high in, in some, some uh, reasonable scenarios, showing that you, this speed can actually be bigger than some uh, escape velocities of some galaxies. Um, I will jump this. Ah, okay. So this is an important thing. One thing that we look at is that, okay, you have uh, high speeds, but it can take, you might think that it can take a long, very long time for this speed to, to, to be achieved. And in fact, if you look into a variety of scenarios for some rest ratio, you, you will see that the time it takes for this speed to, to go to the maximum speed is not that long. It can actually be observable uh, in, your li in our lifetime. So just to show you that gravitational waves for asymmetric binaries also have a kick because it's a different type of, uh, of, uh, of feature, but essentially when you have asymmetric binaries, you have 
also an asymmetric emission of uh, momentum, which in part a kick in your binary. And this can also be a very high speed kick. Uh, and also you can have, uh, you can displace your binary from uh, the galaxy host, okay? So I told you about the eccentricity already, I told about this. Uh, so we, we can try to simplify things by looking to symmetric binaries. So for symmetric binaries, as I told you, there is no kick, but since we are now interested in looking to the eccentricity, it will simplify a lot our equations into looking to symmetric binaries. If we look into symmetric binaries, essentially what we have is one equation for the displace for the separation distance and one equation for the, the how the total mass is growing. Uh, you can do the same and you can compute how much energy is lost in terms of uh, uh, in fun a function of this additional force and also angular momentum. And if you repeat the computation that you did for gravitational waves, but now consider this, uh, this loss in, uh, in, uh, as uh, the medium terms, you will get actually that the effect of, of the, the environmental force uh, is the opposite of the gravitational wave, which is to increase the eccentricity of your binary. And with that, you can uh, also compute, because you have both emission of gravitational wave and you have the effects of the environmental force, you might think that there are some distance in which these two effects should uh, like uh, balance each other. So. So uh, at large distance, what you have, gravitational waves are, uh, emission is, is quite uh, uh, feeble, it's very small, very tiny. So you have the environmental forces dominating, you have uh, uh, one point in which this should be equal, and another point, another region in which gravitational waves should dominate. So you, you can compute this critical distance, I'm just showing this plot, showing the evolution of the bind, the eccentricity, and increases. At some point, gravitational waves kick, it, kick in, and then you have a decreases, uh, decreasing of, uh, of the eccentricity. And this is what you, you get. You get a circular motion that becomes eccentric and then becomes circular again. But there are some uh, intervals there that you could observe some eccentric orbits, okay? And I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions? Thank you, Caio. Um, so my question is regarding this circularization and perhaps more the, my question is actually more about the classical results. So you have an emission of gravitational waves that tends to decrease the eccentricity, right? Yeah. So I was wondering about if there are some key assumptions there and if you go to, um, a theory a extensions of GR if you can counteract this effect in somehow so I was wa just wondering do you have any comments on this and yeah. is this related with this observation that uh, that you made in the end uh, although it is on a different direction thank you yeah I I, I, I wouldn't expect any difference from uh, GR modifications because so uh, at least at this level or if you take the dominant part because the dominant part we always be the Newtonian so if you imagine that any extension of GR should include GR, and these perturbations are like uh, at linear level. So I, I imagine that uh, in, in general you would get circularization. There are some papers that do not, uh, that try to consider. For instance, there is a paper, a recent paper by Vitor and uh, one of I think was one of his students, but I don't remember the, the name of the other author. Sorry. But uh, they try to see how general this thing is uh, by looking into generic assumptions, not to looking into any equations of motion, but on the, the, what would be the, um, the main features of the metric uh, and the energy conditions that you should uh, impose to any additional terms that you could have for, for to have circularization. Because in the end, circularization depends on how the energy and the angular momentum of your orbit change with time also. And you can relate to that with uh, the metric components as well. But I, I think I, I, I would not expect that the circularization results to change with, uh, within alternative theories of gravity because of, mostly because of uh, GR is expected at the linear level. So if, yeah. Uh, 
any online uh, question? You have a question? Yes, please. Just. Thank you, Caio. Uh, in the older paper that you show us, the, um, the fluid that you were considering, in which you were considering the motion, uh, did it have a size or it was infinite? No, it was infinite. I mean, th there are a lot of caveats that you, you have in our assumptions because they are extremely simple, and because they are extremely simple, they shouldn't be very reliable in the sense that, so the result is there. I think eccentricity will grow uh, in some regimes and uh, you will have a kick in your center of mass, but not precisely in the way that we discuss it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if your fluid has boundaries, if your fluid has lumps, uh, if you have, even uh, if, your fluid, if your fluid has lumps, even uh, symmetric binaries would have kicks because you might have that one component is passing through a higher density meter than the other, and this would be enough for to have this asymmetry. So, uh, yeah, so uh, just to, to say that, yeah, it, it's infinite. Everything is nice and beautiful, and, uh, you know, the cow is a sphere. So in this sense, <laughs> it's a physical problem, more like, a, yeah. I propose to stop here. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. So thank you all again.